Good afternoon. My name is Joan Phillips. I'm a nurse and I'm also Vice President of Clinical Support Services at Beaumont Hospital, Troy. I'm here today to tell you about allergies and emergency management and I hope you find this information helpful. To begin, let's talk about what is an allergic reaction. An allergic reaction is an exposure to an allergen that may trigger the body to release a substance called histamine. Normally this happens when the body attacks a normally har harmless substance like the allergen the body perceives as harmful. This can result in allergic symptoms that may be mild or severe and may be very quick in a minute, matter of minutes or progress over a number of hours. What are some of the common allergens? Well, for those of you who have allergies, you're very familiar with these, but there are basically four types. Um, the first is insect stings, and this would mostly include bees and wasps. There are others, but these are the most common. There's also seasonal, and for those of you with seasonal allergies, you're all too familiar with these. Most of the time, it's related to grass, trees, pollen, sometimes animals because animals shed at certain uh, times of the year, and mold. Another category is latex. Latex is a type of rubber that's contained in many items. Uh, the most common one is gloves, rubber gloves. This could be medical gloves that we use in the hospital setting. It can be household gloves that you might wash your dishes or your floor with. Um, also, many balloons are made of latex, so this can be very uh, troublesome for children uh, if they don't know they're allergic to latex. And also medical equipment. There's many items that we use in the hospital that contain latex that can be potentially harmful for someone with a latex allergy. So if you're going for a procedure, the most common one would be, for example, a colonoscopy. If you were going for a colonoscopy, they would ask you very specifically if you knew you had an allergy to latex. And the reason is because some of the equipment contains that. And if you are allergic and your body comes into contact, that could pose quite a problem. So that's the reason that they ask you that uh, in related to um, medical procedures. The last category are foods. And there are a variety of foods that you can be allergic to. Um, it could be things that aren't related um, to this list that you see up here. Uh, but these are the most um, eight of the common items that uh, people are allergic to. And that would be milk or any kind of milk products, dairy, eggs, any kind of eggs, um, peanuts, tree nuts. Now tree nuts are is a, is a different category because peanuts grow under the ground. Uh, tree nuts obviously are in trees and that would include things like walnuts or uh, cashews, things like that, almonds. And then we have fish, it could be any variety of fish. And then shellfish, which is a totally different category, that would include things like lobster, crab, uh, and shrimp. And then we have soy and we have wheat. So those are the common uh, eight substances that you may be allergic to. But again, if you go for allergy testing uh, to your allergy doctor, they could test you for hundreds of foods and different items and the, that not, might not be on this list. So let's talk about um, the different ways that you can be exposed to an, uh, an allergen. And as you can see here, there's four basic types. The first one is skin contact. Now skin contact is pretty self-explanatory. It's where you come in contact anywhere on your, on your skin, which is the largest organ of your body, um, to the allergen itself. So the first one is pretty self-explanatory, poisonous plants. If you're out hiking in the woods and you come in contact with poison sumac or poison oak and you happen to brush your leg against that and the allergen gets on your skin, it causes that release of histamine in the body You'll start with your symptoms. Now, if that becomes itchy because you get a hive there and you scratch it and then you scratch your arm or touch your face, those symptoms will spread. And anybody who's had that kind of allergic reaction knows it can be uh, pretty intense. The second one is animal scratches. Now, if you're allergic to cats or dogs, um, there's two different uh, things you know, uh, that you can be allergic or the ways that you can be allergic. In this particular case, it would be a scratch on the skin. So. Um, what happens is, is the dander or the allergen from the animal makes contact with your skin, which punctures it, um, that uh, gets into your system and your body releases histamine, which causes the reactions. 
And then the last one is latex, like we talked about earlier. Latex is something that's on your skin, and if you come in contact with that, uh, you can um, uh, have symptoms. I can tell you as a nurse wearing gloves for many, many years in the hospital setting, I started to develop a mild latex allergy where anytime I was wearing gloves, my hand would become sort of bumpy and itchy. So that's something that I have to, to watch for myself. The second category is by injection, and it makes sense when we talk about some sort of insect sting. So whether it's a bee or a wasp, you're minding your own business and the insect comes along and happens to sting you. What happens is, is the um, venom from the stinger um, get, is injected into your body, and then that creates that response where your body identifies it as a foreign substance, starts releasing that um, histamine, which causes the symptoms. Um, the third kind is ingestion. Now, medication is on there, and for some of you, you may know that you're allergic to some type of medication, um, but that's by ingestion, and usually if you are allergic to something, you will um, uh, develop a, a, a symptomatic response to that uh, if you have an allergy. And then this also refers to the other types of foods, like, you know, in this on the slide it shows you nuts and sh shellfish, but it really could be anything that you eat. And then the last category is inhalation. Inhalation is where you breathe in the allergen. So for instance, those of you with hay fever or seasonal allergies, in the springtime, you know very specifically when the trees are blooming and budding. Because that pollen gets into the air, you breathe it, and when you breathe it, that's the signal for your body to release histamines. And you know what the symptoms are, which we'll be going over shortly. Another one that you can inhale is dust, and this is very common. I, in particular, am very sensitive to dust. I don't believe I'm allergic to it, but if I'm in a high dust area, I'll start sneezing, but that's the body's common response to clearing out your nasal passages if dust gets in there. If you're truly allergic to dust, you can have other symptoms that go along with it, and usually if you have allergy tests, they will test you specifically for dust and dust mites, things like that. The third category is mold and mildew. Mold and min mildew, um, what people don't realize is it usually grows on something, maybe a wall or um, um, the floor of a shower, or um, sometimes even the bottom of a shower curtain. But what happens is, is there, those are made of spores, and the spores are released into the air, and um, those are breathe, um, breathed in, and then that can cause the response. And then the last one, um, under inst inhalation is animal dander. And again, if you're really allergic to, for example, dogs and cats, and you enter someone's home that has a dog or a cat, your symptoms will usually progress very quickly and your eyes will become runny and your nose runny and those sorts of things. So again, with um, pets, you can either inhale the dander or it can come in skin contact. So let's look at what happens uh, symptom-wise. So this is a, a picture of a man, and it shows the insides of their nasal passages and their, and their oral passageways and their eyes. So what happens in a mild allergic reaction? Again, remember that when you are exposed to an allergen, something that your body perceives as a foreign object, your body uh, releases histamine. Histamine is what causes the symptoms, such as red, itchy, watery eyes, sneezing, congestion, a runny nose, um, and then if you look at, uh, on the picture, if you look at the throat area, if you can see the passageway, it's pretty wide open there, but it can cause uh, itchiness, sore throat. What happens is your nose starts running, it drips into your throat, causes that post-nasal drip and sometimes a cough. So these are all things that are very common with seasonal allergies uh, and are not life-threatening. There are, are some other symptoms. Um, sometimes you can get hives with some mild itching. Um, sometimes these are caused by seasonal allergies, molds, or pet dander. And a good example is, is if you have a shower curtain, let's say, in your shower, and a little bit of mold grows on the bottom that you haven't seen. And this actually happened to my daughter, who's very allergic to mold. She took a shower one day, and there was a little tiny bit of mold on the bottom of the curtain. And when she got out of the shower, she had hives all over her lower legs because the water had splashed on her skin and it, and it caused a reaction. So sometimes you have to really look for the cause. Now the treatment for a mild allergic reaction is over the counter, very simple, and I'm sure most of you have heard of antihistamines. 
And remember, histamine is what's released in the body to cause the symptoms. So what do we take? An antihistamine. What this does is it blocks the release of histamine in the body in response to the allergen. Usually dries up your nasal pass passages, dries up your eyes and your throat, and you feel relief from the symptoms. So let's look at what do common allergic reactions look like. So in the case of mild seasonal allergies, like we talked about, here's a picture of a woman suffering. She's sneezing, blowing her nose, looks generally pretty miserable. Her eyes are watery and itchy. She's got that post-nasal drip, and she's sneezing. Very uncomfortable feeling, but usually very treatable with the over-the-counter antihistamine. This is a picture of a mild insect sting, and I say mild because this is a localized reaction um, within the absence of uh, more systemic or bodily um, reactions. So hopefully you can see in the picture the red dot, um, that's where the insect sting is. There's an area around it about the size of a penny, and that's a penny there just so that you can see uh, a comparison. So it's a raised area uh, swollen around the bite itself, and then there's an area of kind of a red raised um, section around the insect bite. This is a considered a mild insect sting, and in the absence of breathing problems and other more severe symptoms, uh, the person just has to weather through this. These are usually pretty painful. Um, the best remedy is to try and remove the stinger if it's present, and you can either um, pick it out yourself with your fingers, uh, tweezers, or sometimes if you have like something like a credit card, you can swipe across it. The only thing you don't want to do is push the stinger in. You want to pull it out uh, totally. Here's an example of what a mild food, food allergy looks like, and this is a toddler you can see in a picture. Now, a toddler's not going to be able to tell you how they feel, but you might be able to see. But a small child or, or an adult um, will be able to explain how they feel. So this child ingested something that they're allergic to. So they have, uh, you can see they have mild hives around their lips and their mouth. Um, the person may have itchy, watery eyes and itchy throat. Um, and sometimes mild nausea and stomach ache. And you may ask, why would they get a stomach ache? Well, histamine is released from two places in the body. The first uh, source is the lungs, and that's why you get all the um, respiratory symptoms. And the second um, place that secretes the, anti or the histamine, the second place that secretes the histamine is the stomach. And this is something that people don't normally relate to allergies. They always think of the stuffy nose and the breathing. But you can um, definitely get stomach symptoms. And if you're eating something and having some mild symptoms with the stuffiness and, and you get some mild um, stomach symptoms, whether it be diarrhea or a little nausea, um, that can very well be related to allergies as well. This is uh, showing what a medication allergy might look like, and I hope you can see the rash there on this person's upper trunk and arm. It's a pretty generalized rash. Some of the spots are pretty big, some of them are pretty little, and really a, a rash can look like anything. Um, uh, but in this particular case, it's what we call a systemic rash because it's all over. So if you're allergic to a medication, hives are very common. And the number can vary. It can be a few. It can be, you know, moderate to a large number. Usually very uncomfortable and itchy. And again, this is not an emergency in the absence of more severe symptoms. What you would want to do in this case is call your doctor. And sometimes you may develop an allergy over time. I can tell you myself, um, as a normal person growing up, I took penicillin on many occasions for a variety of reasons and never had an issue until I was in my 30s and one time was on penicillin and developed a, a body rash. Um, the only thing I could contribute it to was taking the penicillin. I called my doctor. Um, right away they said, mm, you probably have, you know, an al you've developed an al allergy to penicillin, so now that's something that I have to avoid. But I never had anything worse than, than the rash itself. So again, these are, are mild. So let's talk about more serious reactions, which are really why I'm talking to you today, so that you can learn um, what to do in the case of a serious allergic reaction. And it's called anaphylaxis, and I sort of uh, phonetically spelled it for you there, anaphylaxis. What that is is a, a severe allergic reaction, and it can occur very quickly in a matter of seconds, minutes, 
and if untreated, can cause death. So it's very important that we're familiar with this. It happens when a person with a severe allergy is exposed to an allergen, and it's all those things we've talked about, foods, medicine, insect uh, stings, latex, anything of that nature. Anaphylaxis can occur if you have a known allergy and you are exposed to that allergen. It can also occur if you don't know you have an allergy and are exposed for the first time. This happens sometimes, uh, a common example is in the summer if someone gets stung by a bee or a wasp and they've never been stung before and they um, get stung the first time, they may have a mild reaction which is just a local painful reaction or they can have a severe, if they have a severe allergy, um, have a very severe reaction with much more complicated symptoms of breathing compromise and such. And if you have a history of asthma or heart conditions, that can make it even more serious because you already have an existing condition with either your heart or your breathing. And if you have a, a severe reaction to an allergen, it could make it uh, much worse. Um, the other thing of note here, and we talked about this earlier, is um, always make sure if you have a latex allergy to notify medical personnel if you're having a procedure like a colonoscopy or a bronchoscopy, anything, even if you're admitted to the hospital where um, the hospital personnel wear gloves. It's always a very important to let them know and they will be as part of their uh, physical assessment when you're first admitted, ask you a lot of questions about latex allergy because there's certain things they can do. They'll also ask you about uh, food allergies, they'll ask you about medication allergies, um, and anything else. Um, and if you ever have to have a procedure that has dye in it, uh, for example a CAT scan, that they need to use dye as contrast, they'll ask you if you're allergic to shellfish. And the reason is shellfish contain iodine, and iodine is one of the main components in one of those dyes that they use. So those are the reasons they ask you for that, because if you have a reaction to something like that, it's probably going to be one of the more serious reactions, and we need to prevent that from happening. So in a severe allergic response, again, here we have our man that shows the nasal or an oral passageways. In this instance, you can see where it's pointing to the eyes, and it says loss of consciousness. Now remember, in mild reactions, you're going to get red, itchy, and watery eyes. The reason you would lose consciousness is probably because you've stopped breathing. And that's related to the swelling of the tongue and the rapid swelling of the throat tissues. So what happens again, if you are severely allergic, this can happen very quickly and you may start having difficulty breathing and this requires 911 treatment. Other symptoms you may get in anaphylaxis are swollen lips, eyes, ears, hands, feet, could be your entire body and it's not just simple swelling, it's blowing up like a balloon swelling. Um, the person may get severe hives and itching. They may get flushing. Flushing is a very common symptom in anaphylaxis and that's where the face or the body or the ears will get extremely red and look flushed. This is a symptom of where the blood vessels dilate and blood rushes to that area and that, that ma makes the red color. So that bright red color is also another warning sign. Like I said earlier, you might get tightness of the throat, wheezing, difficulty breathing, talking or swallowing. The person might start to feel dizzy and eventually pass out if they're not getting enough oxygen. The person may also have chest pain and that would probably be related to lack of oxygen, especially in an older person. They might complain of uh, that their heart is pounding. Or if you feel their pulse, which is below the thumb in the inner aspect of the wrist, um, might feel very weak and, and rapid. And again, like I told you, the, the um, second source of histamine release is the stomach. So the person may feel nauseated, may vomit, or ha start having diarrhea. These are all very serious symptoms. So what do we do for the emergency response? Like I said, symptoms can develop over a matter of seconds or may take up to an hour or two. You need to call 911 right away and tell them you suspect a severe allergic reaction or have some, if it's yourself, you need to have somebody else call and tell them that. Do not attempt to drive yourself to the doctor or the hospital. The treatment of choice is medication as soon as possible. If you choose to drive yourself, you're losing precious time and you may stop breathing before you get to the hospital. 
So you need to call 911 because when they arrive, they will have the medication that you need that can save your life. This medication will help your breathing that's compromised by the closing of the throat. Again, the person may um, feel very dizzy, may, may pass out. So when the symptoms begin, always have the person sit or lay down, stay with them until help arrives. So what do we do for anaphylaxis or severe allergic reaction? The drug of choice is epinephrine, and I spelled it there phonetically for you, epinephrine, epinephrine. Once it's been determined you have a, a severe allergy, uh, your doctor may test you for a variety of allergies and may prescribe you, a, you an EpiPen, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, this is something that you carry on your person at all times if you have a severe allergy and can give it to yourself. And your family and loved ones can be taught to give it to you as well. And the main thing to do is to try and prevent the exposure in the future. We also highly suggest you get a medical alert bracelet. If you're uh, severely allergic to bees and you're out on a picnic and you get stung and nobody sees you get stung and now you're lying in the grasp, nobody really knows what's wrong with you. If you have a medical alert bracelet on that says you have a, a severe allergic to bees, this would be an indication that you know they know they need to get help to you right away. And like I said, once you're uh, prescribed an EpiPen, it needs to stay with you at all times. So here, there are many examples of EpiPens out on the market or that the doctor will prescribe for you. You can only get these by prescription from your doctor. Um, this happens to be um, called EpiPen and EpiPen Junior. So the, the yellow packet there is the adult dose. The green pack is the EpiPen Junior. That's the pediatric dose. In any kind of EpiPen you get, you will always get two pens. And you may ask why. And the reason is, is if you start having a severe reaction, you're going to give yourself your first injection. It only lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. If you can't get help within that 15 to 20 minutes and your symptoms um, progress again, it gives you a second dose to buy you more time until you can get help. So every EpiPak pen has, or package has two pens in it. And again, this, is, this brand is called EpiPen. There's many other brands available. There's even some brands that will talk to you and tell you what you need to do. But irregardless of whatever type you use, it will always have the directions right on the pen. And I happen to have an EpiPen here. And if you can see on here, this one says it's a trainer. But this is basically what an EpiPen looks like. And some of them may be shorter and squattier, but they all work in the same manner. They always have a cap. They always have the directions on what to do here, and there's always a tip that has the needle um, on the inside. Now the needle's not showing, but when you press it against the leg and you hear a click, that deploys the needle into the skin, and then you hold for 10 seconds while the medication is going in. So I can show you how it works. If I needed to give myself an EpiPen injection, I'm going to take off the cap, I'm going to firmly grasp it in my fist, and I'm going to firmly press on my upper outer thigh, which I'll show you a picture in a minute, until I hear the click. The click is going to come from where the needle comes out, and just for demonstration purposes, I'll do it on the table. You hear the click, and this comes out. What happens is it protects the needle so you can't accidentally poke yourself again. Um, and that's basically it. So, um, you know, children as little as three years old can do it, and um, if you ever go online and look at the videos, you'll see there's many of them out there that show a, a small child that knows how to give themselves um, an injection. So this is, again, just a, is a summary. You inject into the upper outer thigh, and again, you can inject it right through clothes. Whether you have pants on, it doesn't matter. The needle is pretty long under there. Um, and once you press it to the thigh and you hear it click, you're all set. You hold it for 10 seconds so the medication can be delivered. The next thing you do is you call 911. So if you're on your own and you give yourself an EpiPen, you lay down, hopefully you, you have some, you know, the ability to call 911 and you have your second pen ready to go in case you um, need that second dose before help arrives. Like I said, if you go on the internet, there are tons of videos to, show, to tell you all about EpiPens, to tell you all about allergic reactions. Um, really great ones out there. There's a great one if you Google EpiPen on YouTube. Um, there's a wonderful one that shows a bunch of little kids and the ability of how they give themselves these shots because they have severe um, food allergies. Um, so I showed you the demonstration. 
And I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope you found this uh, information helpful. And today is the day that you just may have learned to save someone's life. So thanks for watching, and have a great day.